Since my last video, I have chopped off my hair and gotten a tattoo. I feel like I look completely different, but I promise I'm still the same true crime freak that you all know and love, or at least tolerate. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload, mostly because I've been doing this for like five years now and I still don't have a consistent upload schedule. So make sure to click that button. So if you are new to my channel since last year, you may not know this, but every single year on my channel for the last four months of the year, I have a different theme for each month. And September is always solved September. So for the entire month of September, I cover only solved cases. And to kick off this month, I was going through my cases and I was like, okay, what case should I cover? And I was like, we are going to cover first in September, the oldest case ever solved using the method of genetic genealogy. Very interesting. But before I get into the case, I do have to say that today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by a company that I absolutely adore and that is Magellan TV. If you are a regular viewer of my channel, then you may be familiar with this service. Magellan TV is a streaming service with over 3000 documentaries and docuseries from some of the best filmmakers and networks from all around the world. They have a ton of different genres, but of course the true crime section is my favorite and they add crazy 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week so us fans will never run out of content to watch and this content can be viewed anywhere or anytime it's compatible with most devices so you don't have to worry about that every time i discuss magellan tv on my channel i have a new recommendation and my latest recommendation is a documentary that i watched this past week and it's called a mother's madness this documentary covers a south african case where five children's lives were brutally taken by the person meant to love them the most their mother, a case that brought the main detective to tears and will have you deep in thought considering all the aspects that could lead to such a tragedy. Is it simply a mother's love turned to hate or a long time mental collapse that could have been prevented? You be the judge. Now, this documentary is deep. It's intense. It's heartbreaking. It's only about 24 minutes long, but it's something else. This documentary is a new documentary released on Magellan TV and I immediately had to watch it as soon as I saw it pop up and it handles this case with care but at the same time it just throws it all in your face to be like this is what happened here are the details and this this is a real thing that happens in this world and we still don't know why how and is it something that we can fix? Do you get what I mean? Very good documentary. If you want to check that documentary out or any of the other ones on Magellan TV, you can go to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis and you can start your one month free trial. Thank you Magellan TV for sponsoring yet again, another one of my videos. And with all that being said, let's get right into the case. According to the International Society of Genetic Genealogy Wiki, the definition of genetic genealogy is the use of DNA testing in combination with traditional genealogical and historical records. Genetic genealogy involves the use of genealogical DNA testing together with documentary evidence to infer the relationship between individuals. This process has helped solve so many cases. It even helped discover who the Golden State Killer was. With the passing of time, it will help solve so many more. We have discussed tons of cases on my channel where this method has helped solve older cases. But today we kick off Solve September with the oldest case ever solved using this method. Well, up until this video is posted. This is the solved case of Patricia Kalitsky and Lloyd Bogle. Patricia Joyce Kalitsky was born on August 20th of 1939 to parents Henry and Catherine in Great Falls, Montana. 
Lloyd Dwayne Bogle was born on January 18th of 1937 to parents James and Albuquerque in Navarro County, Texas. Now this story takes place in Great Falls, Montana. And if you know me, you watched any of my videos, I love giving a little history on the area we're discussing. I've never been to Montana and there's genuinely not a whole lot of places in the United States I'm like dying to go, but I have, I've really always wanted to go to Montana. It just seems like a beautiful state. And after researching into Great Falls a little bit, if I go to Montana, I might go to Great Falls. Great Falls is known as the Electric City. It was given that name because of how many dams and power plants there are there. Booming with the electricity and the Missouri River runs right through it. There are a lot of community traditions there and it seems like the area is very consumed by its history. It's very rich in history and some will say its history began with the famous expedition of Lewis and Clark. But the area had been home to and loved dearly by Native Americans, mostly the Blackfeet tribe. Great Falls though, as a whole, really thanks a main man named Paris Gibson for the way it flourished. He made his way west in the year 1882 and when arriving there, he knew it would be a great area for some railroads. He modernized the city, putting in streets, some parks, and he was very precise with the types of trees planted there. Over time, Great Falls, it grew and developed and became what it is today. And its history is pretty much what makes it. And although every pamphlet you can find on the area focuses on its beauty and delight, the truth is that Great Falls is like any other place. It has its disaster as well. Now let's get back to actual case. Lloyd Bogle, who most often went by his middle name, Dwayne, so I'll be referring to him as such for the remainder of this video, met Patricia Kalitsky in December of 1955 at Patricia's cousin's wedding, and they hit it off immediately. They were just head over heels for each other. It was just, it was beautiful, young love. That is the best way to put it. They didn't know each other long, but when they looked at each other, they saw a future. According to a New York Times article written on the case, Duane was, quote, instantly smitten with Patty. They had a lot of things in common. They seemed like very lively teenagers, and they especially loved dancing and music. At the beginning of 1956, Patricia was 16 years old and Duane was 18 years old. They had barely known each other a month. They were still in the getting to know each other phase, but things, they seemed to be moving pretty fast. Like I stated before, Dwayne was originally from Texas. He was a native of Waco, Texas to be exact, but he was in Montana because he was stationed there. Dwayne was in the US Air Force stationed at the Malmstrom Air Force Base located in Cascade County, Montana. From my research, the two of them, they just seemed like really good kids. They had love for each other and love for life in general. People around them adore them to no end. In a recent interview with the New York Times, Dwayne's niece stated people viewed him as funny and charming. Patricia was described as friendly and witty. Even though they had just started seeing each other, a big thing was Patricia's family already adored Dwayne. He even stayed with them during Christmas of 1955. So things seem to be going really well. Dwayne and Patricia, they just had their whole lives ahead of them and who knows how their lives would have turned out. Dwayne and Patricia, they spent as much time together as humanly possible, like most young couples do. They went on dates often and that is what they had planned for the night of Monday, January 2nd of 1956. They didn't have something huge and spectacular planned, but they just wanted to grab some food and just be near each other. That night, they went to Pete's drive-in restaurant located right in the Great Falls area. They were spotted there just a little after 9 p.m. that night on January 2nd. From there, it is believed that they parked at a lover's lane near Wadsworth Park next to Sun River. If you don't know what a lover's lane is, there seems to be one in most areas back in the day. It was basically just an area where young couples would go, they'd most often park the car and just spend time together. They'd talk, they'd laugh, and maybe get a little frisky. <laughs> I have covered quite a few cases on my channel that involve areas like this, although they are known as areas for loving. They, in reality, become areas where people knew vulnerable teenagers would be at. Although like 99% of the time, nothing bad would happen at these areas, they became areas that were 
easy targets at times. Say, if someone wanted teenage victims, a lover's lane was really the perfect spot. On a night like a Monday, not many people would be there and it would become a perfect time to go through with an evil plan, which is unfortunately what one sick individual did on this night of January 2nd of 1956 in Great Falls, Montana. That night got later and later and nobody had heard from Dwayne and Patricia. Hours passed by, but Patricia's family, keep in mind that Dwayne's family was back in Texas, they didn't begin to worry. At first, they thought maybe Dwayne went back to the base and Patricia went to the home of one of her sisters. After discovering that that wasn't the case, her parents, they still did not worry. According to reports, her parents, they believed that the lovebirds possibly went off somewhere to elope during the holiday season and that they would be home eventually. They thought this until the next day when a gruesome discovery was made. On Tuesday, January 3rd, three boys were walking near the Sun River in Great Falls and they stumbled upon Dwayne's lifeless body right next to his car. He was laying on his stomach. His hands had been tied behind his back with his own belt and he had been shot in the back of the head. Like I said, he was not far from his car, he was right next to it, and pretty much everything in the car was left on. The ignition switch was on, the headlights were on, even the radio was on. It, it just, when you looked at the scene, it looked strange. These three boys, they did the right thing and they notified police immediately. Police came, they checked out the scene, and there were a few things that were very odd besides the car being left on. One of those things was that whoever was responsible for taking Dwayne's life had left behind Dwayne's very expensive camera. Other than that, there was also $5 left behind on Dwayne's person, which in today's time is about $48. So the motive possibly being robbery, that didn't seem very plausible. I mean, it was a very horrible scene and the Great Falls area, the, the authorities there, they were not used to seeing anything like this. And Dwayne's family was notified of what happened. They were obviously in shock and they began their grieving. But this is when police were informed that Dwayne hadn't been alone the night before. He had been with his girlfriend, Patricia. So where was Patricia? On January 3rd, everyone was in disbelief of what happened to poor Dwayne, but they all had a little bit of hope that maybe Patricia was still out there. Maybe she had been kidnapped and maybe she was still alive. Maybe they could locate Dwayne's killer and her kidnapper and find her before this person did anything else, before they took her life. Unfortunately though, the very next day, everyone's worst fear, it became a reality. On Wednesday, January 4th of 1956, Patricia's remains were located. A road worker came across them while on a gravel road named Vineyard about five miles north of Great Falls and about eight miles from where Duane was found the day before. Patricia's body, it had rolled down an embankment off the main road. Just like Duane, she had been shot. At first, because she had been fully clothed when they found her body, they did not believe that she had been sexually assaulted. But after further testing, they did eventually discover that Patricia had been raped before her life was taken. Based on Dwayne's remains and Patricia's remains, it seemed Dwayne was immediately killed after being tied up and Patricia was kept alive a bit longer, kidnapped, taken elsewhere, then taken advantage of and killed herself. Police did determine that both Dwayne and Patricia, although they were killed separately in two separate locations, they had been killed execution style, which if you don't know what that means, that means that they were forced on their knees and then shot from behind. News of this case, it spread rapidly. A couple slain by an unknown killer on a lover's lane. It was on the cover of every local newspaper and people wanted to know who their killer was. But they had no idea that information wouldn't be found out until over half a century later. The community of Great Falls was so deeply affected by this case. No one could believe that such a horrible crime happened there. People really truly cared for this case and they treated it with care, but they were determined. At the beginning of this video, I discussed the railroad being 
a huge thing in Great Falls. Well, Patricia's father worked for the Great Northern Railroad and with the help of his fellow workers, they were able to gather up some money to put forward for a reward. They ended up putting forward a reward for over $6,000, which is a good chunk of change, even in today's time. They really thought that this money, it would, it would help someone come forward with, with a bit of solid information, but nothing came of it. Who would do such a thing to such good kids was the main question on everyone's mind. Was it someone who had it out for Dwayne or Patricia? Or were Dwayne and Patricia just in the wrong place at the wrong time and someone evil came along? Who was the person or people responsible? Were they a local or someone who was just passing through the area? There were just so many questions. Through the years, there have been quite a few people put on this case and there have been dozens of theories looked into. All in all, there have been about 35 potential suspects in this case, but no real solid ones. One of the very first people though looked at was someone at the same base as Dwayne. When authorities spoke to Patricia's mother, she did inform them that Dwayne recently told her that he had been in an argument with someone back at base and he was very upset about this. It really got under his skin. Authorities looked into this individual, but after further questioning him, it didn't seem like this person had any involvement in the murders. As time went on, more possible suspects arose. Some more believable than others. One main person looked at for the murders of Dwayne and Patricia was James Whitey Bulger. Now, Bulger was a mobster who focused his attacks in the South Boston area in the 70s and 80s. He was convicted of 11 past murders in the year 2013. There wasn't a whole lot to connect him to the case and discussion today, besides the fact that he lived in the Great Falls area in the 1950s and was arrested for rape there in 1951. Bulger. He was a mobster. He was just a bad guy with a criminal past in the same area as a double murder at the same time it happened. So authorities thought possibly he could have been responsible, but there was never any solid evidence that pointed to him having any involvement. But it was something, it was a theory that they kind of kept to the side as a possibility. He was eventually cleared though in this case, just like all the other possible suspects. This was really one of those cases that constantly hit dead end after dead end through the years. And the people working on the case were just waiting for technology to get advanced enough to where they could find out something else. One big movement came in the year 2001 when a vaginal swab from the autopsy of Patricia from years back was sent over to the Montana State Crime Lab. They tested the swab and they discovered the vital bit of evidence that would end up eventually solving this case, a single sperm cell. After coming across this single sperm cell, they tested that DNA against the DNA of Patricia's lover at the time and fellow victim, Dwayne. It was not a match. That sperm cell did not belong to Dwayne, and since they did discover that Patricia had been sexually assaulted, that DNA had to belong to her and Dwayne's killer. After having this bit of DNA on file, there were some people from back in the day that were possible suspects that were on their radar for possibly being involved, and authorities wanted to compare this supposed killer's DNA directly to the DNA of those people to see if it was a match. One of the people they did this with was a man, a convicted serial killer named Edward Wayne Edwards. Have you ever heard of him? If you're deeply into true crime, you might have. Some people who looked into this case really thought he was their guy, but there was never any evidence to tie him to the murders. This killer had been coincidentally arrested for burglary in the state of Montana in the year 1956, and he had served time at the Montana State Prison, so he was in the area at the time of Dwayne and Patricia's murders. A former Great Falls police detective named John Cameron, he even wrote a book, an entire book about this man Edward Wayne Edwards. The book is titled, It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. In this book, he goes into detail about how he believes this man was responsible for many lovers' lane murders around the country from back in the day. 
Edwards had five confirmed victims, but it is suspected he had quite a few more. John Cameron believed that, and still believes, that not only did Edwards kill Patricia Kalitsky and Dwayne Bogle, but that he was also the Zodiac Killer. I mean, it's a crazy theory, but I mean, you never know. John Cameron was even quoted saying a few years back, the fact is he's a Zodiac Killer and he survived for 66 years killing and framing people. And that's what the Zodiac said in his letters he was doing all along. Well, they did end up comparing the DNA found in Patricia to the DNA of Edwards and he was not their man. Could Edward, Wayne Edwards, be the madman behind killing many more people from years back? Could he be the Zodiac Killer? I mean, who knows? But we do know he wasn't responsible for this couple's murder. Still, although they had this forensic golden ticket to solving this case, it took time for everything to come together, which usually it does. Testing it against more people and trying other methods as well, they entered the DNA into CODIS or the Combined DNA Index System in the hopes of coming across a criminal match for the DNA, but still nothing. Detective Sergeant John Cadner was put on this double homicide case in the year 2012. He grew up in a small town in Iowa and was not very familiar with the case, but he was determined to finally solve it after so many years. He was quoted saying, there was just years and years of documentation and numerous suspects that had been looked into, but I knew the key was going to be DNA. Like I stated at the very beginning of this video and many videos before, genetic genealogy was what helped discover the identity of the Golden State Killer. And that case, it was literally declared pretty much impossible to solve. So when it was solved using this method, people all around the country, they kind of perked up. Detectives started taking this method seriously and decided to go down that path when it came to the cases at their departments that had been sitting there for decades. There were detectives all around the country that were like, okay, we have these cases that are 10, 20, 30, I mean, 60, 70 years old and technology, it's finally to where we can take those older cases and scientifically solve them. Sergeant Kadner basically sat there like, okay, this method can track down the man responsible for one of the most heinous killing sprees in American history. It may just be able to solve this case. And he was completely right. Genetic genealogy, it is all about DNA and they had their DNA of the suspected killer. With the help of the Virginia company, Bodhi Technology, they took this DNA sample and they built an entire DNA profile from it. They took this profile and uploaded it onto a public genealogy database, and they were able to create an entire family tree from this DNA sample. It ultimately led them to a man, a man named Kenneth Gould. The DNA matched Kenneth's, but Kenneth had passed away in 2007, so authorities needed to test the DNA against his actual DNA again. They needed to see if the DNA that was found in Patricia was actually Kenneth's DNA. But since he passed away and they couldn't exhume him because he had been cremated, his children offered up their DNA and it was a complete match. Kenneth is their guy. On June 8th of 2021, it was announced to the public that they are very confident that Kenneth Gould was responsible for the double murder of Dwayne Bogle and Patricia Kalitsky. Since he is deceased and they will never be able to take him to trial, legally they can only say that he is the quote unquote most likely suspect in the case. All in all though, like I said, He's their guy. Little is known about Kenneth Gould, but we do know he was 29 years old at the time of the murders and was living in the Great Falls area at the time. He actually lived about a mile from Patricia's home. If that seems close, he even kept horses only about 600 yards away from where she grew up. We know Kenneth had married in the year 1952. The girl he married was only 16 at the time. He was 24. The couple would go on to have five children. Kenneth did what many killers do. He moved from the area not long 
after it happened. He and his family moved from Great Falls only about a month after he killed Dwayne and Patricia. They lived in two other areas in Montana and then moved to Missouri in the year 1967. He eventually died in 2007 at the age of 79 in Oregon County, Missouri. Besides him being so close to Patricia's residence during the time before the murders, police have never found anything else to tie him to the lives of Dwayne or Patricia. And after he left the state of Montana, he never returned, not even to visit family. Based on records, it also doesn't seem like he committed any other crimes. He doesn't have a record. Authorities have no clue if he just did what he did to Dwayne and Patricia and just lived a normal life from there on, or if he possibly did something else similar before or after and just was never caught for it. We, we don't know. When his children were told that their deceased father was being looked at as a suspect in a double murder case from 1956, I mean, they were stunned. They had no idea of any past criminal behavior, but his daughter did say, you just never know. Some people just have secrets they never told anybody, which I mean, as horrible as it is, she's right, it's true. Some of Dwayne's family is still alive and was able to hear of the news but for Patricia, sadly, most of her loved ones have passed away. She does have a sister that is still alive, but that sister unfortunately has very advanced dementia and doesn't really remember what happened to Patricia and Dwayne all those years back. It doesn't really resonate with her. Most of the people closest to them have passed away before it was solved. It's very sad, but throughout the years, it being unsolved definitely ate up at them, quite a few of them. And it being solved, although it is a very exciting thing, it does resurface some buried feelings though. And that is one of the difficult aspects of a case finally being solved after so many years. According to medium.com, Dwayne's niece explained this paradox best. So if I was asked if this great modern technology is a great thing, I would say on balance, yes, for my generation, a generation once removed, but it definitely reopens old wounds that have had a chance to crust over. This case in general, I just really wanted to cover it because it shows how advanced our technology is becoming and how many older cases are finally being solved. And for a case that is 65 years old to finally be solved that's insane because there are so many cases out there that are you know 10 20 30 40 years old 50 years old and people feel like those cases are hopeless and they're not but all in all that is the solved case the oldest solved case ever using the method of genetic genealogy the case of patricia joyce kalitsky and lloyd Dwayne Bogle. My heart goes out to any of their family, any of their friends, anybody who was directly affected by what happened. And I also salute anybody who was involved with finding out who was responsible. Cases like this are just so important. It gives hope to people. It gives hope to detectives, to family, to friends, to people that their whole lives are dedicated to solving a mystery. And this case just, it, it proves that it's possible. And with this case, it's very bittersweet. I mean, I'm not going to sweep that under the rug and act like there's fireworks going off because it's solved. Because in actuality, when you look at it, the man responsible, he was free until the day he died. He never really paid the price for what he did. And that that is probably the main aspect of this case that is so unfortunate. And also, who knows what else he could have been responsible for. But I do seriously respect his children because from all of my research, they really, they put all of their feelings aside and worked with authorities. Another sad fact is that the three individuals who were there that night, the three individuals who actually know what happened exactly have all passed away. So that mystery, that will never come to light. But this case, it's solved, that's the important thing, and we are entering Solve September. If you have any cases that you want me to cover on my channel that have been solved, make sure to send those to gabulosiscaserequests at 
gmail.com. With all that being said, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to watch this video and hear about this case. And if you have any thoughts or opinions, and especially some nice comments to go to their loved ones, write those down below in the comments. And I will see you all in the next video.